Guten Abend, welcome everybody in here and out there. I'm very happy to welcome Miroslav Bauka tonight here. He's not only a member of Akademie der Künste here in Berlin, he's also a participant in the exhibition Arbeit im Gedächtnis, Transforming Archives. And we want to talk about his work later on, his work in relation to memory. But before that, let me, or let the two of us, uh, recite two short quotes from a poem by the Iranian-German poet Said, who unfortunately died only about two months ago. I will read the original German, and Miroslav will read a Polish translation. And we would like to place it before our talk as a kind of motto. Ich weiß, in Deutschland muss man ohne jegliches Sentiment sein, wenn man ernst genommen werden will. Mein Heilmittel gegen diese Geistesschwäche, Sprache und Gedächtnis. Ich verbinde durch die Betrachtung die Zeit mit dem Raum. Dabei beschütze ich ohne Rücksicht auf Verluste die zwei Regungen meines Lebens, Gebärde und Erinnerung. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be here. Such a good company in the place which is important for me. And now I will read the verses in Polish. Wiem, że w Niemczech trzeba być pozbawionym sentymentu, jeśli chce się być akceptowanym jako osoba poważna. Moim lekarstwem na tę mentalną słabość jest język i pamięć. Poprzez medytację łączę czas z przestrzenią. Bez względu na straty chronię dwa impulsy mojego życia. Gest i pamięć. Thank you. We will go through the work of Miroslav Bauka in uh, three chapters, so to speak, but not chronological. One chapter is place and memory, the second one material and memory, and the last one language and memory. We'll concentrate on works after 1990. That means we'll leave out the early figurative work from the second half of the 80s mainly, um, that would be another chapter for another time, and that would be body and language, obviously. First image you see over here is an image, a view into a small house in Odwotsk near Warsaw in Poland. Miroslav, you have to tell the story of this house briefly. So <clears throat> we have the images behind. Where are the images? Ah. Oh. Okay, yes, actually that's a very important place for me and uh, in this exhibition downstairs I'm sharing with people the video which was made in the studio and the video was made in night. Here we see the daylight, the photo taken in the daylight it looks quite messy, but this is the place where I'm working and collecting materials which later are the subject of my work. The house is, uh, was very important for me as this was the house where I grew up. Actually, not in such a mess, but in much more nicer situation. But but tra transforming the place where you live to the place where you work, this was quite important task for me since beginning of the 90s. And I think that the fact that I work in such a place related with life was uh, orientated or directed my 
art in the direction where I am now. Probably if I wouldn't meet this place as a working place, I would be somewhere else. So this was the place about, it was the relation between privacy and public, the relation between dimension of the works and, and different levels which I discovered slowly, step by step, year by the year. So, yeah. And um, this house, of course, is part of a larger settlement of the town of Odwotsk. And if we go to the next image, we see actually Google Maps, but we see two parts outlined in black. The house is positioned where the, the letter A is. And uh, well, the outline is the outline of the Jewish ghetto during the German occupation. But you discovered the fact that the Jewish ghetto used to be very close to the house where you grew up only much later. Huh? Yes, yes. So. A lot of my works are dedicated to the memory also and uh, to the knowledge and uh, the lack of knowledge as well. You know, I, I grew up in the city which was very Jewish city before the Second World War and uh, the fact that the borders of the ghetto were, were so close to the place where I later lived uh, became part of my knowledge only in the 90s, so when I was already working as an artist. So, as I told you about layers in the uh, interpretation of the place of living, so my first circle of investigation was the circle of the house, and later the ripple across the water was touching the much wider area, and this Aria was the area of the history of the small city and the Jewish history of the city. And the fact that the question was why I know, why I didn't know this before. So also it determined my later video works, which were a kind of the pilgrimage to the places of the of Holocaust in, in Poland. You also made one video actually in the old house. You opened the entrance to the underground, the cellar, uh, and just filmed the dark hole, pronouncing a certain sentence in Polish addressed to the generation of your fathers and forefathers. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it was a question, you know, why you didn't hide any juice in the cellar? And I was asking the seller, because I didn't know that maybe it was used for this kind of the shelter, maybe not, but uh, I guess that not. But I believe that the places are built of their own lives, like the house which we started uh, the presentation. It's like the organism, which has a different, uh, different parts, which could be related with the the human body in some way. I mean, usually the function of the house has this relations, you know, the functions, but uh, yeah. Somehow then, a little later, you started to not only use materials from that house in sculptures or installations somewhere else in very different places. In one case, for example, you in a way transported and transformed the house, the, the general outside shape of the house to Sweden, to an outdoor exhibition. Uh, so this is a, one view onto the, the core of the house, so to speak, with this very unusual way the upper part of the walls are inclinated outside, which starts a lot of uh, associations, at least with me, I think with you too. Yeah. Actually, first, <clears throat> this sculpture, which now is in Umeå, which is very north of Sweden. First, it was present presented in uh, Malmö Konsthalle, which was in the beginning of the night, is very active place for art. And it was uh, 
the sculpture was the, in scale one to one the walls of the house, but uh, you couldn't enter vertically to the house. You know, the only entrance was this semicircle which you see on the photo, and to enter the house, you you have to crawl down. You know, so it was the only possibilities. So for me. I, because many of my works at that time were about the relation of the physical body and the, the architecture. So entering or leaving the house like this in the horizontal way, it was related also with the taking the body out of the house in the horizontal way, which I remember like my both grandparents, they were leaving this house uh, in vertical way, because it was still the time which I remember from the 70s and 80s when, when people died also in the house. They, they were not very fast swept away to the hospitals and uh, taken away out of the presence of the other people who live in the house. So I think people had to work out the subject of the death in the family. It was not taken away very fast out of the eyes. So this was this relation, but anyway, it was a kind of the fortress in some way. And, uh, and important, the two materials of this work were the concrete blocks and in the gaps between the slabs were a field because there were some gaps in between, so they were filled with the dried leaves. So for me, so the material, the sculpture is described is concrete and leaves. So for me, it's also this interesting relation, nature and culture. You said it's a very close space and obviously, obviously it is. You mentioned the entrance, but at the top, it opens up in a way to the sky. This is, would be one very positive image that I associate with it. But to me, there's also a more kind of negative image of a certain type of very solid and uh, bad fence. Yes, yes. It's not Berlin Wall, but it could be kind of the wall of protection. But protection you had to describe by yourself which side protects you, you know, so it's always about this discourse. I'm not saying that you can be safe inside, maybe you can be, because this could be when you're inside, if you somebody will lock this small hole, you are in the prison, so it's always, you know, my works are very much about negotiation of the, of the space. And actually, when I make, in Uma, mm -hmm. I make the, this exact walls uh, of the studio. So in the north of California, in the place called Geyserville, I made the floor, which is exactly, exactly in the shape of the floor plan of the house, which was my, which is still my one of my studios. And I think it's quite interesting from the architecture point of view and future, because if you in one thousand years or 3,000 years or 5,000 years. We don't know how the world will look like, but if somebody will find like the foundation of the shape of this, of the shape of the plants of my studio in Otvotsk, uh, in California, then it will be quite interesting task for the archaeologists if they will be there still. To find out about the Balkanian culture. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You actually made me put this image into our sequence as well. Uh, obviously, your work is only only the small slabs, the small kind of doormats that accentuate the transition from this long corridor into actually the sleeping rooms of a medium famous piece of modern architecture by Mies van der Rohe in Krefeld, Haus Lange. Um, we did an early show there in 91 or 2, I think. Uh, let me see. 92. It, it was in 
92 exactly. Um, and um, so this is a little bit away, of course, completely from the house in Otvotsk, but uh, still it's the metaphor of the house is very much involved, the metaphor of the threshold that you go from one space, one situation, one state of mind maybe, into another one. You have to step over something that must not be physical, but you go from one position to another position, from one situation to another position. And just materially, it's interesting because you can't see it in this image. Those are simple metal slabs, but they stand on little feet, little round metal feet, and the feet stand on tiny bits of white felt. So those very, uh, uh, no, it was not felt. No, no, not this one, Julian. Are you sure? This is Actually, we know each other for, for a very long, long time. It was one our first exhibition. Mm. But actually, this metal slabs cover the pieces of the carpets, artificial carpets. Memory, our subject. Yes, yes, yes. But anyway, uh, it was the fact that in 19, the beginning of the 90s, uh, I started to work in this old house, which was the house of my childhood. And year later, I got Miss van den Rohe stipendium and I could spend some time in Krefeld in one of these villas uh, uh, made by Miss van den Rohe. It was very important uh, relation for me with different kinds of the architects, you know, very poor architect with, uh, in the house which was built by my grandfather who was a carpenter. I don't know if in the 30s and, and with the house which was built in the 30s with the prominent architect. So I had this experience of the two different ways of thinking, how to, what is the house, what is the architecture and this, as you said, the threshold is always, I mean, in, as a term, philosophical term, symbolic term, and material term is very important. Uh, and these thresholds were placed next to the doors of the children. And actually, this part of the house is very low, as you remember. So I, I didn't want it to make anything. I wanted to make something flat. But the exhibition was titled Bita. We come to language later in the next chapter or okay. the chapter after that. Um, but why did we choose this image? You made me choose it. Okay. Maybe just to talk about our No, it's a beautiful, beautiful image by yes. itself. So we stay with the motive of the doormat, but it's completely transformed in this piece, which has obviously, as we can see, a kind of performative aspect too. It's uh, called common ground. And uh, if you don't see it on the image, this piece is made by a, a large number of used doormats collected from all kinds of people. Yeah, actually the work which is titled Common Ground, uh, the doormats comes from Krakow, from the very poor uh, district of Krakow, mm, city in Poland. And very important uh, element of this work was the performative aspect. Uh, we, with the young people, were knocking to the doors of the people and asking them for exchange the old used doormat for the new one. So this is the result of the exchange. So it was very important performative element. And later I, I put all these doormats, uh, which was about 200, uh, into the form of the square. In, this is the f image from the exhibition um, in Hangar Bicocca in Milan. But these different doormats, from which also uh, were standing uh, in front of the entrance doors to the individual uh, individual interiors. Very, they were serving as a as a element to sweep sweep the the shoes before entering. But also they were kind of the thresholds in front of this. Uh, 
doors. So I, once I put them together, they, they started to be like the, the ground of togetherness. So they changed the function from this individual protection of individuals. They became, uh, they became the island of suggest, suggesting uh, being together. together yeah. Without distinguishing the individual experiences with these dormers or the individual memories that have been trodden into that, yeah. uh, into those uh, doormats, yeah. So another place with memory, but also with a outlook to the present and the future when you mentioned the togetherness. A very different place, a no place, a non-site, if you like. This is the installation how it is in the Turbine Hall in Tate Modern in London, 2009. Actually, this is the view of this enormous piece of steel. I mean, it has the dimension of a, of a big ship, so to speak. Uh, this is a view that you see only later when you have come along the way. The entrance to the Turbine Hall is in the far end where the light is. So first of all, you should just see a closed box and then you have to go all around and then only you come to this ramp and you go into it and there is not only nothing, it is pitch black inside. Really, there is no light whatsoever, at least as, you don't turn, as long as you don't turn around. So this is a very kind of place in the shape of a no place that immediately, of course, starts your imagination about all, not all possible places, but certain types of places. Um, so it seems to be very abstract, but actually it's full of images, full of stories, if you like. Yeah, but the stories are to be bring by the people who have the experience of being there. So there is no story written on the wall. It's the story which you can generate it by yourself. So it's in some ways the place as a catalysator of the thinking or about your worries or about your being, especially in the big contrast to the situation which I only saying the relation between Millennium Bridge, which leads from St. Paul in London in a very enthusiastic way, which brings you to the Tate Modern. And then finally you are, after entering to the sculpture, you were confronted with unknown. And uh, so it was the time, 2009, when the phones were not so good in making the photos in the darkness. So after the experience of fantastic photos of Thames and the two banks of the Thames River, you, your presence with, the, with, the, with your phone was disturbed, which was also the part of the work that you are in imperfection, unperfect situation in such a perfect context, you know, of the institution, of the beauty, of the... So, so it was, but it's very hard to talk about this work because when we look at the image, yeah. once it was very much about experience because otherwise if you haven't been there, you could say, okay, I can switch off the, the light in the room and it will be dark. Yeah, but I mean, you, you can save this, but, but it was really about experience of... Uh, of the black hole in some way. It was a black hole in this particular cosmos, not only the museum cosmos, but the London cosmos. Yeah. Uh, and the, the lively city. Of the and, cosmopolis. And the yeah, the cosmopolis. Uh, so it was not so much about the outside. The outside was a necessary feature to create the inside. But it was all about the experience inside, the individual experience inside. Yeah. And you really got lost there. It's an experience which is actually very hard to, do, to describe. Of course, if you turn around 180 degrees, you would see the light, the remaining light from this dark part of the turbine hole coming in. But once you look inside the black hole, it was really like that because it was non-reflective. The walls were really not, next to no reflective. Yeah, but being together with the other people, it's like with the work, former work with the dormats when I said about the togetherness, it was also important fact that you are united 
with the others in the darkness. So you can start to feel the link with them in the hard situation. When how, uh, how it is was uh, a kind of abstract place, this is a very special concrete place. Although you've whitened a very important part of what is in the image, image um, so it might not be recognizable for most people. If you wouldn't have whitened those things, which are buildings on the left and right, maybe some little more people would recognize the place. It's called, it's part of a series of four uh, prints and it's called A Crossroad in A. Now, what is A? Yeah, I mean, A is for Auschwitz. I don't want to make the number of letters of the alphabet related with the concentration of death camps, but T for me is for Treblinka. But in this case, this lithography was based, actually lithography is quite important, because I, I made maybe two lithographies in my life. Uh, but it is based on four photos taken in one crossroad in four directions. And uh, making this work in uh, lithography, you know, touching the stone and erasing the, the buildings which were representative so-called culture, architectural culture, and leaving all, only nature, it was a gesture which was related with a kind of very personal memorial, which was on the paper. Because this technique of lithography, you know, you put this paint on the, on the surface of stone and you make a print. And later, to make another print for somebody else, you erase the layer of half millimeter of the surface of the stone. So for me, this gesture of touching the stone, the paper touching the stone, was also beside of the story, of course. It was quite important gesture, physical gesture of dealing with the past, dealing with memory, and erasing, because here I re erased by myself the image of the building, and later, the total image was erased to make another print. So it's very much about memory, and memory is very much about forgetting. So, beside all the stories which are related with the Second World War, it is the story about erasing our memories. Finally, in this section, to make a kind of big jump, <laughs> geographically, but also, I think, in terms of the, the nature of the work. Although, obviously, it is, again, a very special place, a cave, a cave in a mountain. But then you have something brightly shining in the center, and actually, it's not only the place, but you yourself, as a, as a visitor, are obviously reflected. You don't see it here in this nicely made photograph, but uh, you are reflected in, and distorted, actually, in, in this image, and it has a very nice hard to pronounce title, Narcissus Sush. <laughs> Narcissus, you know, the Narcissus, Narcissus, the mythological figure, uh, who saw his image in the, on the f in the mirror of the, of the pond. Caravaggio. Yeah, Caravaggio most, painted it. <laughs> the most. Uh, but it's an old Greek story. Um, and Sush is a tiny little place in the Unter Engadin in, in Switzerland, where there is a museum now, and that's where it is. Uh, but um, this is a very, it looks like a kind of artificial place, actually. The, 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 the rough cave, but then there's a very smooth ground. So obviously it's something that has been heavily manipulated, this place. Well, I think it's very well designed a museum of the Polish collector Grażyna Kulczyk. And uh, I was very happy that I was asked uh, for the site-specific permanent work in one of the part of, of the space, which the idea was to make the re relation with such an old cave, 
you know, thousands of years with our presence in this space because the, this cylinder was revolving and uh, you could find it when you look longer a little slowly, slowly, slowly very slowly so in some way you were entering you became in a very strong way connected with what surrounds you and sometimes you have to look at the mirror to notice this relation you know because when you see yourself in the mirror otherwise you are just present but the presence is much stronger when you see yourself so i think it's it's beautiful work that's why i came to the title as narcissus Sush, which was written together which made quite nice relation language relation and i think that uh, but this was I, not often i make i don't make often the works with the polished steel as this material used here but uh, it was my response for this context and for this hundred thousand years of the history you know so to make the relation to bring us closer to this history and sometimes to do it you have to use the mirror that brings us to the next chapter material and memory and we start with very different material different from polished stainless steel um, this is part of an installation in 1990 uh, at the Venice Biennale in the so-called Alperto section in the Correria. Most of you might know this uh, very, very long, rough place. And I, I put it here because this was my very first experience with any work of Miroslav. Uh, I had never heard about the name, I never heard, seen any work, and I was marching through this kind of endless uh, space of the Corderia, and suddenly on the left side, I think it was, when you entered it, um, I saw these very sparse element, and I went closer, and I kind of recognized it was mainly old, used pieces of wood, reformatted, so to speak, put it into some kind of, looked like very poor sculpture, they had a certain body quality nevertheless, although they were flat materials, but they had a body quality. I was always tempted to touch them or to come very close to those vertical things. I really wanted to, to lean against them or kind of bring my own body in relation to these uh, 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 objects, these, these, these figures, if you like. Um, and I was very tempted by the materials. Of course, there was a kind of art historical association to Arte Povera, okay granted, but not important. Um, and of course, one thing was particularly interesting, and that's why we also have here a detail. This is a detail from the same installation, but in another context, in a show in, in Poland. And you see there is this construction, which is like a table or a bed, possibly an institutional bed, like in a hospital. Um, and there is, you can see, um, uh, an electric pillow. Uh, in the right place uh, for the head in this case and it's connected to uh, by cords to the to the mains and um, Actually, you're supposed even to touch it. You know it is warm warmer than the surrounding But you can also touch it and then you feel something like well the body of another person if you like Yes, yes It was exhibition good God and uh, it was the moment one of the first work when the body disappeared in the physical presence as before I made quite strong group of the figurative works dealing with mythology and subject of Christianity, saints, etc. So this was about absence and the use of the material you mentioned uh, Arte Povera, but this was a real Arte Povera. It was not, it was not aesthetic decision of Arte Povera artists, but it was decision, uh, material decision, showing my uh, presence at that time in the physical world. I didn't have any other materials as uh, old used uh, planks and 
the heating pillow which I found in the house, which was not in use any longer. So I combine all these materials and uh, it was like you see this is the, the shelf on the right side of the image and the, the shelves are made in the way that you cannot put anything on them because there is angle 45 degrees so everything fall down. So it's very much related with the with the literature represented by Samuel Beckett. At that time I didn't read yet Paul Celan. So it was a very Beckettian group of works and the title was very important, Good God. So the word God represented good but but hurt good like not good yes and the the venice exhibition 1990 was extremely important for me but also which is quite interesting relation with the what was very supportive for this work in this context was the natural walls of the of arsenale which which i was able to use because when I entered, when I was installing the, the work, and at that time I was completely unknown artist, so it were white uh, plaster walls covering these original walls. And I wanted to this be uncovered. And I remember like the people in Venice Biennale, they said, no, it's impossible. And you, when you mentioned this long corridor, and I remember, like I said, okay, if not, I'm leaving. And I've been walking like 10 minutes this long corridor. And uh, finally somebody ran after me and saying, okay, please come back. We will take away the walls. And sometimes this natural background is very important for the presence of work. And it's very supportive this natural beauty of the real architecture, you know, this poor architecture can be very supportive. So for me, I think it was very supportive at that time. Because also the concept of Arsenal at that time was the stand by stand, you know, so it was the line of 100, standard, 100 boots yeah. on the left side and 100 on the other side. Mm -hmm. But this materials, like many people also, like very much the the trash hold which is in the front yeah and actually what i did after preparing the space i i swept the dust under this trash hold yeah so this was also important mm -hmm. gesture of beside of the heat let's go a little bit through the various materials which are sometimes rather unusual materials that you used and still use sometimes so we had the old used wood we had uh, the pillow, or warmth as a material, so to speak, and also the white that makes the top of the table or the bed is actually salt. And that brings us to the next piece. No, it was concrete. It was concrete? Yes, yes. It was white concrete at, at that time. I didn't discover yet the salt. But you discovered it then in for the show in Amsterdam. Which was one year later. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Good. Anyway, so now this is salt. Actually, this is a slab of terrazzo topped by a, a piece of um, wood, steel. 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 Uh, and uh, under, the, under the slab uh, and along the edges, you put salt. And actually, the, the, let's say the nickname of this work was uh, sculpture or work für Kaninchen. Yes, Ein Stück für Kaninchen. Ein Stück für Kaninchen. <laughs> because it, it's, uh, this is the garden of uh, Haus Lange, Krefeld. And I noticed that it's many rabbits running around. Mm -hmm. So installing so many sculptures inside the house, I decided to put one slab with the favorite of the rabbits salt under the terrazzo slab and actually we have i, mean, I couldn't find this but there were some photos taken with the rabbits being around so Be it's nice because not only for rabbits but also for humans life is absolutely necessary to live yes 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 <laughs> 
Um, and we know that it's sold in our bodies. You do it like this. Now we're all sweating a little bit or more. Um, and uh, how symbolical for you is the use of something like salt, which is an everyday material, but normally it relates either to the body or to the kitchen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or maybe you don't like to talk about this no, symbolic no. level, which is uh, always a bit tricky. No, symbolic, uh, interpretation of symbolic also depends of uh, interpretator. Yep. So if for somebody the use of the salt is related with kitchen, so it's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's other symbolic, it's, uh, it's also fine. But I was always very... Uh, I had always very romantic soul, <laughs> so uh, for me this salt from the beginning, I, my interpretation was like dry tears or dry sweat, mm -hmm. and so both related with emotions and uh, an activity of the body as well, and also the weakness of the body, mm -hmm. uh, which you mentioned saying about sweating. So, so this was the starting. So for sure, it was not related with the the ocean. It was related with the presence of the human body and some imperfection in the functionality of it, and also the soul imperfections. Yeah. In a way, one step further with the human body, and we finally come to ash. <laughs> These are the walls of a gallery space, and they are covered up to a certain height with ash. There are m some other works where you used ash as a, as a, as a kind of a very ephemeral material. Here it becomes part solid because it was fixed somehow uh, to the wall, but still it's a very ephemeral material that's left over when a lot of things have finish their lives. Yeah, my relation with with Ash started in in the studio, which we started our presentation, where I had to use coal and wood uh, to heat the space. And as my father and probably gran my grandfather, uh, naturally born uh, ecologist. I didn't throw away the ashes. I just collected. I didn't know what for I'm collecting them, but I've been collecting them. And then having so many ashes, I started to make work using these ashes. And for me, seeing how this ash is produced, the ash was not just the ash, but it was a trace of the heating. So the, the process of heating the space, heating the architecture, heating the body, but it was always the, the trace. So one of his more radical work was covering the wall of the gallery and mm, to the height of two and a half meter, which was always one of the basic uh, height important height for me, like the modular of uh, Corbusier. Le Corbusier. I built my modular uh, based on my dimension. So this was as much as I can reach. This was the top line of this, uh, uh, of this wall of ash. So it was two and a half meter. And these ashes were the ashes uh, used from my studio kitchen. And then brought to actually London. At then brought to London and actually it landed uh, this work in the collection of... Uh, first it was in the museum, Jewish museum in uh, Jerusalem and then uh, now it's in Tel Aviv Museum of Art. Actually, and actually to make the work again you have to so actually the ashes are not any longer mine ashes, not from my place. They have to be produced uh, in different way mm. because after, this is the work which you cannot use again, yeah. these ashes. Actually the title is to finish with that piece, uh, Dead End. So it's a, it's a very radical piece in relation to ashes in your uh, oeuvre. 
Another unusual material is soap, pieces of soap, used soap, arranged as a kind of nearly little endless column, to, to quote Van uh, This is like 10, a little bit more than 10 meters high in the aforementioned Angarbicocca in Milano. And um, actually, this is, has also a performative aspect in it, because as far as I remember, you asked people around uh, to deliver, or you gave them pieces of soap, and you said, and after a few weeks, you give me back what, what is left of the soap, and then you just put it on a big, on a long string. Yes, it's very simple work, but also very personal, you know, because each slap of this soap was personally, very individually, was carrying the trace of the hands which were using the soap. So it was very individual memories in each of the piece, but putting together, they started the dialogue of, of of togetherness, which I mentioned uh, before. So it was important to show such a, to show the power of such a weak, very easy to break pieces of soap. When being together, they start the dialogue about the endless column of Brancusi, who you mentioned. And again, in a way like the salt and like the ash, it's an ephemeral material that tends to dissolve, to, to, to evaporate, to, 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 uh, to uh, disappear in a way, or being transformed into something else. Here, a material is transformed into hygiene, if you like. Yeah. Body yeah. hygiene, yeah. Yeah, but for example, this is very fragile work, but mm -hmm. I remember when years ago, the first of these lines of the soap was bought uh, to the collection of the Tate Modern. I have very long uh, conversation by email with the conservator of the Tate, how to protect it. Mm -hmm. And we found the way. And, but it's so nice when the institution is not afraid of getting such a, such a fragile material into the collection, because somebody could say, OK, let's cast it in bronze, uh, aluminium, and let's paint it in yeah. the co color how it was before, because it's also possible to make it. But then we will lose the smell, yeah. because it's quite important to tell that standing in front of this column, you also feel the different smells, good or bad. Or the disappearance of the smell, the memory of the smell, because maybe over 10 years or so, the smells will more or less disappear. But still, you know that soap smells and different soaps smell differently. Yes, your, your mind is remembering yeah, this yeah, yeah. so far. And briefly go through some other materials at the end of this chapter. There's also water, black water. Black water. Yeah. Black water streaming down from a pipe into a huge steel basin here. And uh, this is something that we will discuss later in the last chapter. Uh, this has a German title, Wege zur Behandlung von Schmerzen. Yes, because the title comes from first presentation of this work in, uh, in Wroclaw. Breslau. Which is Breslau, yes. When uh, it, it was during the European Congress, which was in Wroclaw, and uh, for me it was important uh, voice giving the title and also building this work because what was important in this work that the water was coming out of the building going on the outside wall and then it was bring again to the building so it was the circulation outside inside and the title was also the and this solution was important to point that first you have to discuss about the source of the pain our days you know we are inventing the pillows yes who are pain reliefs and with the history you cannot do it like this you have to work on this subject you have to discuss you cannot just say okay that, the, that something was black something white everything is the shades of the of the 
grey and this is the, the place of the negotiation. And this image is quite interesting also. It's quite funny because the stream of water which comes doesn't look black, but it was really black. And I remember when I installed this work in uh, Hangar Bicoca, I couldn't believe that this black water, they make it black. And on the, in real, you could see as a white water, I mean, as a transparent water. I even asked the technicians to show me, to prove that this is really <laughs> dark water. So they yeah. get the <laughs> container and we took it outside yeah. of this black space and it was really black water. So it was quite interesting also relation because what we could, what we could see uh, it can be different that, that, it is, that it is in reality, yeah. you know, that this black water was not black water, however, it was black water. You know, it's so also it's nice about memory, metaphor, yeah. also... Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice metaphor about me what you talked about memory before, that, uh, of course, a very shiny black reflects a lot and it but reflects the white light. So it is always in between. You can never tell one, is it one or is it the other? It is both at the same time. But it's also the, the complex of uh, the context of St. Thomas, you know, of... I had to check this water to yeah. believe that this is really black water. I <laughs> had to put knew, the fingers yeah. in the wounds <laughs> in some way to say, okay, yeah. I believe now. And yeah. sometimes we need this contact yeah. with the real body to believe yeah. in something. At the end of this chapter, we come back to the beginning in a way. We come to the material of uh, terrazzo. Terrazzo, in a way, you could say it's the poor man's marble. <laughs> It is a composite material, can be quite easily made, but this was the main material of your grandfather because he was a monumental mason. And uh, also your father was a, a craftsman. He was doing the engravings on the tombstones in the cemetery in Otwax. This is a picture of the cemetery in Otwax where they find there used to be, there are less now I understand, a lot of tombstones that your grandfather and your father made. Yes, which was the very important, uh, the second image, the graveyard where it was very important uh, place f for me when I had the con contact with the different form of the small architecture, I would say, as a child. I didn't know at that time when I was helping my grandfather established the mon monuments in this graveyard, established, I mean, I was bringing him uh, the iced tea made by my grandmother in the summer days. But uh, grandfather made many, many tombstones in Otwosk. And this material, now nobody wants to make the tombstones in Terrazzo because it replaced by by the cheap stones from China, from South Africa. So it's much easier to make uh, tombstone now uh, in this uh, noble material as granite. Mm. And this, but at that time it was the reality of material reality of of the time. So. Yeah, I put a lot of attention to it. Actually, as a, as a young boy, I was also supporting my father when I was painting. He engraved the letters on the tombstones and I was earning money painting with black paint with letters. So it was my relation with this, but this are my artistic uh, roots, I would say. This was your first academy? Exactly, exactly. Like. One of my grandfather was a carpenter who built this, the house which we showed. Another was building tombstones and other houses. So both of them, they were related with the architecture, I would say, and uh, with the aesthetic decisions as well. So and this is the piece you made from the remains of one of those tombstones? Yes, because now they are, there is the fashion to change the tombstones, yeah. you know. So what they people do, they throw away the terrazzo. Mm -hmm. And I, from a couple of years, I'm collecting them in my yard. And later I transform them into 
into the sculptures. Mainly by lifting them up a little bit, so there is air from underneath where normally there is earth, yeah. and also lifting the slab on top. And there's a kind of openness, the, the wind goes through it, so to speak, metaphorically. Yeah. And uh, it opens up this box, this final box, which is normally by definition very closed. Um, and uh, in a way, this was also to me to exaggerate it now and a kind of symbol, huh? yeah, a symbol of, of a resurrection in a way. In some way, yes, but resurrection through the gaps. Through the gaps, sideways, yes, not vertical no, like exactly, the other guy. Exactly, yeah. because gap is also another material yes. which we can mention. The gaps are yeah. quite important in my works, and this tombstone can breathe. Yeah, absolutely. so it's not any longer closed box. You know, it's and it something. has a very strange sculptural quality between the heaviness of stone or terrazzo and the lightness of an empty space. It is it's hard to define. You you see it. This was shown in a rather small gallery in a small place, uh, not too big. But it was not dominating the place, although it was heavy and it was like two meters something long, etc. Uh, it was light at the same time. It was really in between a transformation of this very physical material that you knew so well, that you know so well. Uh, let's go, because we already talked for one hour, let's come to the chapter number three, language and memory. And we start with a, a piece which is uh, permanently installed in, in San Francisco, in a, in a campus in front, I think, of a hospital, or is it true? Mm, health department. Health department, okay. So they're teaching doctors, future doctors. Um, and this very nicely, of course, shows uh, the, um, the combination of a piece of language, the word heal, health department, and the sculpture. And the word exists in two fashions, in two uh, uh, states, so to speak. One very physical, from uh, stainless steel, as the kind of so-called roof of this little passage. And the other one, in a very ephemeral, transitory way, by the shadows that these letters make on the floor, together with the four stands. So sometimes you can actually read the shadows, sometimes it's more difficult to read the shadows. And just to give you a fuller view of this, because there's one particular detail which you didn't see in the first image, I think. It's a small water basin that delivers uh, drinkable water. Yeah. Actually, the choice of the, of the word heal was, for me, very important as an element of the education of the future doctors, that everything, the health, started from the healing, and the healing at the beginning was not made by the professionals, but it was, I mean, it was made by the professionals, but not educated professionals. Other kinds of professionals. Other kinds, of, yes, we could say. But, uh, and uh, also, this work was related with the fairy tales, which were, which were quite important for me. It was always the situation when the source of the healthy water was healing somebody, when uh, the, the sons of the sick father were sent to pick up the healing water, and usually the, the most stupid in the, in the fairy tale was the one who, who found this water, but the fact that you can drink from the word heal was important because the medicine i think is also about uh, it's not only about organs of the body it's also about believing about uh, well but this photo looks like the maquette yeah. uh, but but i make the few works with the text written on the top like the work which is in, in Krakow, Auschwitz Wieliczka. And actually, this was just before such a good uh, presence of the Google Maps. But these are the works when you can Google, you know, you can find, you can, yeah, like how looking at the mm, Google Earth, finally you can find, if you come closer to San Francisco, you can read 
the word hill yeah. or googling the Krakow you can find the word Auschwitz Wieliczka yeah. so when I made this work I didn't know yet this possibilities that yeah. it will be such a normal thing to check mm -hmm. the satellite view of the space in such a good way mm -hmm. and finally they became kind of the interesting they started interesting relation with the mm -hmm. space and uh, <clears throat> um, so heal the one word is, is a rather simple word that everybody kind of understands, but you kind of worked it into a, a sculpture. Uh, let's go over to an exhibition of exhibitions, so to speak. This was an exhibition in 2001, plus go, minus go. Strange title, we come to it later maybe. And um, actually it consists of those ter terrazzo slabs leaning against a wall inscribed with the title and the dates of, I think, all your solo shows between uh, 85 and 2001, eh? Yes, yes, exactly. It was presented in the National Gallery in Warsaw, Zachenta, and it was a kind of the game with the retrospective, because every artist who was invited to have the big show in this National Gallery was making kind of the retrospective. And uh, I interpreted the problem of the retrospective exhibition. So I make these titles of the shows and the dates, the day of opening and the, the last day of the exhibition were the days of the life of the exhibition. So it was a group of the tombstones of the exhibitions in some way. And it's like in the graveyard, you know, if we walk through, we can find the name, which can be familiar, but most of the graveyards, 99.9% .9 persons we don't know. So it was also about this relation that somebody who been close to this exhibition, something he will start to think about it. Most of the people don't, but... Uh, but we put this, uh, the images of this show into this chapter because of the language. Here we see uh, on the right uh, the slab for the exhibition Bitter, which was already mentioned in this uh, Mies van der Rohe building in Krefeld in 92. Um, actually, in a lot of exhibition, for a lot of exhibition titles, you choose German words. Um, there is another one here, Winterhilfsverein. I think the, the Nazi organization was called Winterhilfswerk, but you choose Winterhilfsverein. <laughs> yeah, but also the fin Winterhilfsverein exists. At, yes? Yes. I, I could never found it, but yeah. Maybe we, we have looking to, look. to the different books. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but uh, we actually it was a time before when the, the date, 95, so... Wikipedia didn't exist yet. No, okay, it was, you really checked the big books, huh? Yes, yes, <laughs> <Not> yes. <Wikipedia. laughs> no, but no it, it doesn't matter, because uh, in a way it's a German word, obviously, that, uh, you know, also uh, raises associations with a certain period, because it, you can... You no, but the German, German... Not necessarily, but... Uh, it's the language of the philosophers, important philosophers. Yes, but I, I was talking about Winterhilfsverein. I never found this in a book of philosophy. <laughs> no, I, I want to ask you, basically, uh, why there are so many German words uh, in your titles and in some of your works. There seems to be a strange kind of echo because you're not fluent in German. You, you understand quite a lot of German, but you're not fluent no, as a speaker. You know, my, as, as you know, you know my, my, I had some German lessons in school. Uh, it was a program of having the second language uh, beside Russian, which was obligatory language. And uh, we had the teacher who, who was the teacher of chemistry, but they knew that he can speak German, so he started to teach us German as well. But when, when he spoke German, he was crying. And it turned out that he was a prisoner of the camp. So it was quite, and I, and I still remember, however, it was, I was 10 years old or something like this. I remember this guy crying, but that's not why I gave the titles. 
of many exhibitions is German, but it's just one of the layers uh, of my connection with German language, I would say. But for me, it's because I always had idea that, uh, the idea that once I choose the title for exhibition, and it exists in that the, the, that the title is not to be translated. So when I'm saying Winter Hilfsverein, it's Winter Hilfsverein. So it's not to be translated like Winter help uh, something. So, and I made, I found that these German words, uh, they sound better than English ones. You know, I didn't want it to, to translate everything. So for me, it was like the, Na neutral language for for giving the titles of the shows, you know, strong. I told you about these philosophers, but they, of course, there is a shade in some of the works, shade of the Second World War, and the German words which I remember from my childhood, watching the television, for example, when it was this anti. Nazi propaganda, you know, and I could hear only bad words in in, in German, I would say. But maybe I wanted to say something with these German words. Because for me, if you read at the list of my exhibitions, let's say from 1990, if you read title after the title, for me it's still the poetry I'm working on. You know, so it's one not finished yet uh, poem, yeah. which starts with the exhibition, I think, Good God. Mm -hmm. And Good God was also not to be translated in the Polish Dobry book or German, the same, but it was Good God because it was this relation, poetic relation, God good, you know, so. And uh, you are a great fan of poets. You actually also read the poems of, for example, uh, Paul Celan in German, um, but also other poets, English poets, uh, for example, or you had, I think, once your students reading poems by Michelangelo. <coughs> yes, because this was when I started uh, educate the process of being a teacher, academic teacher at the sculpture department in Poznan, I thought that uh, one of the tasks was that the students had to know by heart one poem of Michelangelo uh, in the Polish translation. And later, when I showed this work, and so the students were reading, actually at that time I had six students. It was my beginning, a pedagogical beginning. And later, for me, it was quite interesting work with language. When I showed this work, this video works uh, with this Polish students, only girl, um, reading the poetry of Michelangelo in Polish. When I showed this work in, uh, in Rome, in Italy, I made the translation from Polish translation back to Italian and contemporary the, Italian, not Michelangelo's Italian. Exactly, but from Polish translation, not translating. And, and the subtitle of this reading in Polish was Italian, but translated from the... So for so many, my Italian friends, it was just like the scene or something I shouldn't do, you know. But for me, it was also this language work, you know, about being lost in translation in some way. Because the, the yeah. poetry of Michelangelo was very hard to read for young people, even for me being older, because the translation was very old. So the language was completely not our language. But... Uh, At the end of our talk, we would like to briefly come to the work that Miroslav has in this exhibition, and that actually gave the title to the talk, Schule und Haus. We'll later tell you why it's called Schule und Haus. 
But uh, first of all, let's listen for like one minute or so to uh, the, the one of the two sound pieces that you made. Um, and uh, he is actually incorporating that language. I hope it works now. Meine Familie. Ich habe einen Vater und eine Mutter. Mein Vater heißt Hans. Meine Mutter heißt Marie. Mein Vater und meine Mutter sind meine Eltern. Ich bin ihr Sohn. Ich habe auch einen Bruder. Er heißt Kasimir. Ich habe auch eine Schwester. Sie heißt Wanda. Ich mein Bruder und meine Schwester, wir alle sind Kinder unserer Eltern. Wir lieben unsere Eltern und unsere Eltern lieben uns. This comes from a brochure, a primer for beginners in the German language, published in Warsaw by the German authorities in 1943. This is the year of the Warsaw Uprising, for example. But this book, this booklet, which you actually have here right with you, uh, has a personal history. Yes, maybe two years ago I, I found it in the place which I, in the old wardrobe in my old studio, the place which I didn't look uh, too often to this place. And finally I found the book, uh, which was the book of my mother, as you said, the book from 1943. And my mother at that time when she was studying German was 13 years old. And it was just one year after the total extermination of the older Jews from Otvotsk, the place where I had the studio where I lived. And it was so shocking to see, to see the time context and uh, when she was taking this German lessons and these lessons were about Schule and house, about the body, about the family and if you confront these lessons with the time, with what happened in the history of the world because we cannot only say about the history of Poland so it's very terrifying so for me, the reading of this is a tribute to, to history in some way, not only to my mother, but to the all 8,000 more Jews, which I didn't know about uh, when I was young. So like this pilgrimage to to the concentration camp. This was also the part of uh, building the relation with the past. So it was also absolutely necessary that you yourself read from this book and don't yeah. ask, for example, uh, an actor to read from it. No, no. That's, well, I think it's very important also for the history and time that this book uh, printed in 1943, could be presented right now uh, in Akademie der Kunste in Berlin, uh, that the time has changed and we can live in the peace and, uh, and we can remember. I think we, don't sh we shouldn't add anything because your last sentence was summing it all up. Thank you, Miroslav. Thank you, Juliano.